and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker, and today I have uh, an extra special treat. Not just a special treat, but an extra special treat, because I have uh, two special guests with me. So um, the first one is uh, my one of my old mentors, Dr. Tony Costa. Welcome back to the show, Tony. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, Dale. Uh, we also have someone who's not a stranger um, to the SNS uh, ask listeners of the show, uh, the Christian lawyer, Teddy Pappas. Hey, Teddy. Hi, how are y'all? Perfect. All right. So so today what we're doing is um, Tony, Tony's actually uh, teaching a new class on, uh, you know, religion and po- political issues and social justice issues and that sort of thing. So. And I know that uh, Teddy's been very vocal on the SNS sites because uh, they did a show on racial justice and, and that sort of thing. So it seemed like this is a an appropriate topic to to really look at well, what what is the Christian to do on some of these important political and societal issues that uh, seem to be coming up these days. Um, but just before we actually get into the the topics, uh, if you guys just want to each take maybe five minutes to give sort of a brief introduction as as to who you are and what you've been up to since you've last been on the show. Um, So, so Tony, I'll throw it to you if you just take five minutes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Well, uh, my name's Tony Costa. I uh, resident in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I uh, am currently a professor at uh, Toronto Baptist Seminary and also uh, adjunct professor at Heritage College and Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario uh, in Canada, not the Cambridge in England, the Cambridge in Ontario, Canada. And I also teach as an instructor at the University of Toronto. And my areas of of specialty are usually areas pertaining to biblical studies, theology, systematic theology, philosophy. Um, I also deal with apologetics, which is giving a reasoned defense for the Christian faith, uh, articulating the Christian faith in a meaningful manner, equipping uh, Christians uh, with handles on how to go about doing that. Uh, I'm also a uh, ordained minister um, and uh, a pastor as well. And so I, I wear two hats, the, both the academic and the clerical hat, uh, or I guess the clergy, the hat of the clergy. And uh, currently right now, I'm teaching a course, which is very ap- apropos to what we're discussing today. I'm teaching a, an online course on a Christian response to social justice. And so uh, during throughout this course, we are looking at various issues pertaining to uh, things like Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ rights. We're looking at so-called white privilege. We're looking at uh, issues uh, pertaining to progressivism and uh, colonization and the whole the whole arguments about the slave trade, the the responsibility of the of of the West and in the slave trade and 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 so-called oppression, uh, uh, the patriarchy, um, equity, uh, safe space, uh, things of that nature. So it's it's a it's a very broad area of study, and so it's very relevant con- considering what's going on right now, uh, particularly in the West. This is primarily a Western phenomena. You will notice that this is not going on in the continent of Africa. It's not going on in the continent of Asia. The, these are issues that are germane to the West. And uh, hopefully in this discussion today, we can uh, kind of unpack that on why this is mainly a Western phenomena and not a, an Eastern phenomena. Um, and I also uh, engage in, in various seminars. I uh, speak at various conferences uh, on these subjects. I also uh, specialize in, uh, in Christian outreach to Islam. And so a lot of my work involves uh, uh, debating, dialoguing with Muslim imams and teaching Christians on how to share the gospel with our Muslim neighbors. Um, So that's pretty much it, Dale, and um, look forward to the show. Perfect. All right. Um, So, yeah, I'll turn it over to you for about five minutes or so, Teddy. Do you want to just sort of introduce us as to who you are and um, give us sort of an update as to what you've been up to since you were last on the show? Sure. And I, I'm a criminal defense attorney and um, I'm in the United States. And so I tend to have uh, my perspective uh, anchored to the U.S. Um, but one of the things that I want to talk about today is just with all of the, the rioting and the 
political upheaval that's going on in the United States right now. Um, I want to press upon uh, the issue of what uh, the founders and the framers of the United States Constitution wanted to emphasize um, in our Declaration of Independence. Uh, it was written, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And even though these words um, in the Declaration of Independence were never really legally binding, they are at the heart of what America stands for. And they undergird the United States Constitution and they, they form what we would call in the law a condition precedent for the formation of a republic where the rights of an individual, not the group, reign supreme. And, and it was because the founders of America and the framers of the Constitution, it was because they were Christian that and because they believed that one day that they would be judged by God Almighty, that this provided a powerful incentive to them to create a government that recognized the freedoms um, that individuals have and so that government would not be so big as to trample upon the rights of man. And, and the reason why um, we believe that men, you know, as in all of humanity, have these rights that are unalienable is because uh, of the instruction from the Bible that man is created in God's image. So this gives man a, a dignity, a worth that government should not um, try to trample on. And so um, it's from that mindset that it's important to, to understand uh, what, what the founders and the framers had in mind, and then the big stain on our society of what slavery did and how um, that was just completely undercutting what this country was supposed to be about. And then the correction uh, that took time to come about and, and then where we are now. So I hope that we'll, you know, get into more of those um, details and, um, and also as to the issue with the United States where frequently uh, it's asserted that there is a wall of separation between church and state. And in fact, that is not <laughs> the case. Uh, that, that is not what the the founders and the framers of the Constitution ever intended. Uh, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution talks about how Congress was not to enact a law creating a religion, as in a federal religion. There were states that had had state-sponsored religions prior to the ratification of the Constitution, and even at the time the Constitution was ratified, uh, there were six states that still had a state-sponsored religion. So um, it was never meant that religion had to be excluded from the public discourse. It was just that no religion should, uh, and no, no laws should oppress people and force them to be religious or irreligious or going into a particular denomination. And so it was to preserve religious freedom or the choice to not be religious. But uh, so anyway, we can, um, I'm sure we'll be getting into uh, more of those topics as we, uh, as we speak. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, on that front, so I, so I've, what I've done as the as the host, I, I've kind of looked at uh, the issue, a lot of the issues that Tony 
bringing up in his class, as well as listening to uh, some of the issues that Teddy mentioned that are important to her. And I, I've kind of broke it up into three main sections of discussion. So the first one is going to be talking about this this notion of our of individual rights and that sort of thing, and and as a means for seeking truth and and the value of you know finding and discovering truths and having the freedom to explore to discover that obviously a, a lot of times uh, you know f notions of free speech and that sort of thing where christians will share uh christian truths we're, to we're told constantly well that that's offensive you, you know you're, you're against this or that and and you're this is hate speech uh and that sort of thing so it, yeah, I wanted to know uh, from you guys. I'll, I'll give you guys each some time to make um, opening statements, and then hopefully you guys will have uh, a bit of an exchange af after that, an informal discussion for a bit. But well, yeah, what when it comes to seeking truth, um, should Christians value the truth? Um, are there times where, if, in, in the first place, is a Christian speech, is it actually hate speech in some cases? Are there times when Christians perhaps should use uh, lies? Um, so, as Tony will know, um, is, in Islam, I think there, I think it's called takia, um, where you can use deception for certain aims. Um, are Christians ever allowed to use that to, to in their efforts to promote Christianity and that sort of thing? So, so yeah, uh, Tony, I'll, I'll start with you. Just give sort of your opening on on this n notion of truth and and having these freedoms to to explore right. yeah right well it's interesting because uh that was the the question that pontius pilate posed to jesus after mm -hmm. jesus was arrested and flogged and uh and uh battered and they placed the crown of thorns on his head he was brought before pilate's judgment seat and if you remember pilate asked jesus are you a king and he says for this reason i came into the world to bear testimony to the truth and whoever's of the truth hears my voice and then you can just imagine pilate just looking into his eyes and asking Jesus, what is truth? He makes those immortal words, what is truth? And of course, uh, Jesus doesn't respond to his, his question. And I think the irony there is that the readers of the Gospel of John already know that previously Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so this is important because Christians are truth people. We ought to be lovers of the truth because if we follow the one who claimed to be the truth, then truth should matter to us. And therefore, uh, Jesus said about the truth that the truth has the power to liberate people. Remember, he said in John 8, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so there is something liberating about truth. And since truth is one of God's uh, attributes, because throughout scripture, God is repeatedly called the true God, uh, the God who loves justice and righteousness, and justice is the foundation of his throne, uh, it, it follows from this that, that truth should matter to us. And, you know, the Apostle Paul, St. Paul said in Ephesians 4.15 that, that we ought to speak the truth in love. And, and this is where I think, Dale, we really need to keep this balance, that we're not just speakers of truth, but as Christians, we need to speak that truth in love. And what that means is it doesn't mean we sit back and just give people the hardcore truth without showing any affection or love towards them. But it also doesn't mean that we should just love bomb people and not say anything truthful so as not to offend. And I think that truth by its very nature is offensive. And that's why Paul could say that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And I also think that in order to be able to speak the truth, in order to have freedom of speech, that entails freedom to offend because some people are going to be offended. Uh, and, and we have to risk that possibility because, you know, I can have a discussion with you or Teddy right now and I could say something that may appear offensive. But that's that's the price of free speech is that in order to be free, speech can and has the potential to offend. Now, that's not saying that we should be. Uh, as as Teddy, being an American uh, citizen, she knows that freedom of speech is not the freedom to uh, cry out fire, fire in a packed theater. In other words, incitement to violence is not free speech. But barring all of that, I think it's important for us to realize, especially in our day, where Christian pastors uh, are beginning to uh, retreat, they, they're beginning to retreat into the shadows because 
they are afraid of saying anything that may sound uh, offensive or hateful, even though it could be factually true. And so we are now living in a day and age where speaking the truth is the new hate speech that uh, just to just to say something for me to come out and say, for example, all lives matter. Uh, I'm being branded a, a racist just for saying all lives matter. And I'm not the one bringing race into this. It's others who bring race into this. And so I think that at the end of the day, uh, if we don't uphold truth, um, then we are going to easily slip into chaos. And some of that we've been seeing in the United States and the various riots and the so-called autonomous zones. We're beginning to see chaos and disorder uh, beginning to, uh, to emerge out of that. And that's, of course, understandable. Where there is no law and order, you are always going to have, uh, you're going to have uh, chaos and you're going to have Ill illegal activity and so forth. So uh, truth is paramount here. Truth is paramount here. And I think it, it's connected to what Teddy said, that the reason why truth is paramount here is because human beings are uh, made in the image of God, who is the very basis and source of truth itself. All right. Uh, so, so Teddy, I'll, I'll turn it to you to give your sort of opening statement about this, this truth issue. Um, you can take about 10, 10, 15 minutes or so there for your intro. Okay. Uh, well, and actually I gave a part of my opening statement uh, with the initial statement I meant. I thought that was what you were looking for. Um, but uh, regarding truth, um, as a Christian, I'm a firm believer that truth is uh, it's not his truth or her truth or your truth or my truth. It's, it's readily knowable by God because the Bible tells us that um, our God is all knowing and all seeing. And so he is capable of seeing the truth in all matters. And I think that uh, it's possible for, for mere humans to discover the truth. And I believe that that is one of the, the, the main reasons why um, the First Amendment in the United States Constitution gives such um, broad freedom in the areas of free freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, uh, because these are necessary. The, the free exchange of ideas and information and debating them and hashing them out and, uh, and just that whole interchange, which can get messy and it can get offensive legitimately or sometimes illegitimately offensive. But that is part of the, um, the process at, at hoping to arrive at the truth. And, and the truth is, is also important to a society that values justice. Because justice, in order to uh, hope to achieve justice in a given situation, one first has to know what the facts are, what the truth is, so that um, a judge can assess what has happened and then can adjudicate the matter to see you know, what is a, a, a fair result. And so uh, truth is important in, in that respect as well. And, but, you know, nowadays um, it has become so popular for uh, people to um, say, oh, there's just no such thing as truth. Uh, there's only subjective truth. And I think that these people are confusing what, is known as perspective with truth. Because yes, we all have our own perspectives and some people uh, manage to hit upon the truth with what they see and some people tend to not because they might be 
um, very detached from reality for whatever reason. But, um, but, but truth is immutable. It, it just is. And so um, when people try to stifle speech, what they are doing, it, that's a political act of control and an attempt to dominate um, politics and policy. And that, that is just completely not only inappropriate and in some ways, uh, yeah, I mean, some ways it can be immoral depending on what someone is trying to push if they're fighting for something that's immoral. But it's also, uh, as far as society goes, extremely dangerous. And um, our society in the United States, uh, when one group or groups are trying to suppress the voice of another, uh, and, and especially now what is becoming so popular is uh, we, we live in the United States. Our society has, um, it, it had started to really transcend race and the election of, the, of Barack Obama for two terms is evidence of that. The fact that we have so many African-American judges and prosecutors and mayors and uh you know we had two u.s attorney generals that were african-american um, you know that cannot happen in a in a society um that is systemically racist as some people try to claim and and when other people try to fight against that notion because that's a dangerous notion to um, to try to spread when it's not true. No, it's one thing if it is true, but if it's not true, there's damage that comes from that, and we'll get into that later on. But um, you know, you try to to calmly explain why that's not the case, and then boom, you're labeled a racist, and that just uh, is done, you know, in an illegitimate way when there's no evidence uh, to support it. It's still done. And the purpose of it is to create a chilling effect so that not only will you stop what you've been saying, but the, there's the hope that other people who notice what is happening, that they will then cower and be afraid to speak the truth for fear of being labeled a racist. And the fact that being labeled a racist has such a chilling effect on so many people is further evidence of, of how our society in the United States has I mean, not that there, I'm not going to say that racism has been eliminated. It, it, it hasn't been and it never will be. There will always be people who hate. But as a whole, our society um, has started to find it to not really be that big of a deal. But now we have people that are trying to um, inflame the masses, and they do that for political purposes. Uh, when people try to speak out against that and, and bring truth to the table, uh, you know, that creates uh, quite a dust up. And people have to be willing to have the spine, the courage to stand up to that. Because if we don't, I, I I just, it's, it's hard to recognize my country right now. It, it just seems very, very foreign in, in many ways. And, and what is happening is, uh, is, not, is not for the good. 
So, you know, I, it's just uh, sad and we have to be willing to, um, to stand up to, to evil, which, you know, I, I think that uh, some of the purposes, um, you know, there, there is a lot of, um, like I said, political underpinnings to, to what is going on. And so we have to, to be able to recognize that for what it is and to stand up against it. Perfect. All right. Um, I, I want to open it up to a, a bit of a informal uh, discussion between you guys. Um, I, I do have three sort of follow-ups myself if you guys don't have anything, but just in the first place, uh, Teddy, if you don't mind me ju just asking you, um, so you mentioned um, the political aspect to this. Do, do you see any spiritual dimension, like uh, spiritual warfare at, at play at all or uh, in, in these political issues? Um, I don't know if there's a spiritual element in the sense that any time somebody is doing something that is morally wrong, you know, that mm -hmm. that dra drags in a spiritual element to it. But, but um, what I see is um, the Democratic Party uh, having a long history of of using African Americans and minorities and keeping them uh, as a whole, as a permanent mm -hmm. underclass. And they, they want them dependent upon the, um, the government uh, assistance that Democrats are always um, freely handing out because that ensures that they will keep voting them into office. Mm -hmm. And so once these Democrats are in office, then they end up enriching themselves, sometimes through the insider trading that for many, many years, they, they've only somewhat recently started to put in some laws to keep um, congressmen from engaging in insider trading. Um, it, but there's still lots of loopholes to that. And so, I mean, you look at people like Bill and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, who were not um, wealthy when they went into the White House, and you see how much money they're making now. You look at people like Al Gore, who, I mean, he, yeah, he had wealth before, but yeah. now yeah. his wealth is just absolutely exponential but mm -hmm. so you know it, it it's that the it's rich in irony when you hear people like uh our speaker of the house nancy pelosi uh mm -hmm. talking about the evil rich people and, mm -hmm. and it, she is like one of the richest and, and so there is this um it's a weirdness it's i i think it's I've mentioned it once before. I think there's something almost sociopathic about it because it requires the suspension of one's conscience when right. when one tells a lie and it's it is especially when it's such a bold faced lie that it is immediately uh, provable to be wrong, like you know. Nancy Pelosi is acting like the good guy saying rich people are bad and, and let's just soak the rich. And she's the queen of them. And, and, and so, so it's so, like, so, how is that? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's true. There's sort of a hip hypocrisy there. And I, I, I want to turn it to, to Tony as well on the, the same, same sort of question. Is there, uh, say you know with things there's things like postmodernism that that's going around in the world today and and is it uh do you see that there is some kind of a spiritual dimension that's that's driving some of these new philosophies or or ideologies yes. yeah uh, what, what do you think? absolutely dale absolutely you know the bible is very clear that uh, the christians is engaged in an ongoing spiritual warfare a famous passage in ephesians 6 12 we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and 
spiritual powers and so forth. And that the world, uh, the Bible says, the world is led by the prince of the power of the air uh, who, who uh, influences the, the children of disobedience. And so it's very clear from the Bible that there is an antagonist, there is uh, an arch enemy against man and against God uh, who seeks to uh, plunge the world into darkness. And Jesus referred to him as a thief who comes to, to uh, steal, uh, to kill, and to destroy. And we've been seeing a lot of that uh, lately in our world about uh, stealing and, and pillaging and killing and destroying property and so forth. And, and these are characteristics, Jesus says, of, of Satan, of the enemy. Um, and, and so when we look at this type of, of spiritual warfare, I think we need to understand, we need to get back to the question of worldview. And so, you know, Plato said we all have to begin somewhere. We need a, a beginning point, a worldview that that interprets and determines uh, reality. So our worldviews are the, are the grid. They're the lenses through which we interpret the world and the meaning of life and so forth. And we all have this. Everyone has a worldview. Uh, every, uh, atheists and Christians and, and, and Muslims and, and agnostics, everyone begins with a presupposition of reality. And so we need to ask the question, what is the worldview of, of what we're seeing in, for example, Black Lives Matter or various leftist groups uh, or even the Democratic Party? When we think of the Democratic Party, this is the party that defended slavery against uh, the, the, against, uh, the Republicans. The Democrats were pro-slavery from the start. Uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan uh, came out of the Democratic Party as well. And uh, the Democratic Party has, has even to this day, uh, has been using uh, African Americans as a means to an end. They don't really care about African Americans. They, they depend on them to, to exist. They depend on them to keep them in power pr with promises of, of socialism and welfare and, and so forth and so on. But I think at the end of the day, a lot of these leftist groups um, are advocates of postmodernism. And words like postmodern, progressive, and so forth, these are all part of uh, a, what I call cultural Marxism. So, well, not what I call it, but what has been understood as cultural Marxism that derives its thinking originally from Karl Marx, who saw the world uh, in two categories, the oppressor and the oppressed. And of course, Marx defined the oppressor and the oppressed as the oppressor were the capitalists, these were the bourgeoisie, and of course the working class were the proletariat, they were the, the, the people that were being used by these greedy capitalists to, to produce uh, wealth for, for their overlords and so forth, and, and that uh, Marx envisioned a day in which these class distinctions would be obliterated and that a utopian world would be created uh, when all these class distinctions were removed. And of course, um, he saw that through the, the whole economic, the lenses of the economic disparity. However, however, as, as, you, as we know from history, everywhere Marxism has stretched out its tentacles and has brought nothing but devastation, famine, destruction of individual rights. Everything is not, everything's based on group identity. That's why there's so much talk today about group identity. It's not about who you are as an individual as an image bearer of God, it's about which group are you part of and what is your oppress uh, how oppressed are you on a scale of intersectionality? So this type of Marxism that began with Karl Marx, obviously, uh, morphed in the 19, late 1920s, uh, 19, early 1930s uh, with what we call the cultural Marxists, people like uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci, George Lukács, um, and uh, Theodore Adorno and, um, and Marcuse and others. These were Marxists, but what they saw was that uh, the classical form of Marxism didn't work because the revolutions were not happening across Europe after the First World War as they thought they would. And so they said, look, we need to apply the same mentality, but we need to do it by changing the culture. And so what the cultural Marxists did, uh, starting in the Frankfurt School in Germany, uh, was they believed that the only way you could dismantle uh, the, West, the West is by, first of all, dismantling Christianity as the spiritual force behind Western democracy. And secondly, they believed in uprooting uh, Western democracy itself. And so when we look at our world today, it's no surprise that the two main targets that are being uh, aimed 
act is number one, Christianity. Uh, so Sean King calling for the destruction of stained glass windows that depict Jesus as a white man or uh, trying to basically destroy pictures of Jesus that show him as a Caucasian instead, I guess, of instead of being a black person or something of that nature. And then you've got this attack on uh, destabilizing the democratic government of the United States or Canada or Europe, whatever it may be. Um, and so there have been attempts at, as you could see, for example, the White House uh, attempts to tear down statues of Thomas Jefferson or Andrew Jackson or George Washington now is being, they're calling for the destruction of the, of the, of the first president's statues and so forth. All of these are attempts at, once again, destabilizing the West by destroying Christianity, by extolling what Christianity has traditionally deplored, uh, same-sex relations, uh, abortion, uh, things of this nature, and also by referring to Western history as oppressive, as colonizers, um, patriarchal uh, slave owners, and so forth and so on, uh, while giving everything else like Islam a pass, which still practices slavery today, were, was practicing it long before the transatlantic slave trade, uh, and continues to this day without a uh, without a, a peep from the Western media or the UN. So, are we in a spiritual warfare? Absolutely. Um, it, it is there. There is a, a spiritual element to everything, and the forces behind this type of uh, activity that we are seeing, not just south of the border in the United States, but also in Canada and in the United Kingdom, uh, is what? What do we see? It's the same anti-Christian, anti-God. Remember, Marxism is based on the idea that the very belief in God is, is an opiate of the people, that it is a drug that um, causes people to think of a pie in the sky, another world, instead of thinking of working here and now in the in, in the in, in this being industrious and so forth the marxist dream is to is to produce a counterfeit kingdom to the kingdom of god and that is the utopian world which has never been realized in any socialist time in this country and all we keep hearing today is well that's because they didn't practice real socialism or real communism and we're going to get it right this time after you know uh, millions hundreds of millions of people have lost their lives throughout human history so uh, all that to say, yes, um, the, the worldview of, of these leftist groups are clearly anti-Christ. They are clearly anti-God. Uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the, the, some of their co-founders have, have openly admitted we are operating, we are active Marxists. Uh, and so you cannot be a Marxist uh, and not uh, wish to see uh, religion destabilized and, and, also, um, and also destabilize Western democracy. All right. Yeah, I, I want to follow up with my uh, a second follow up question for for both of you guys to answer, and I, I am curious uh, as to your guys' answer on this front. So, I, I think that we all agree as Christians, God is truth. Truth is a highly val a high value, something that is very important to maintain. But um, there are times when sometimes you have to sacrifice. We we live in a fallen world, right? So. Sometimes we, we have to sacrifice on the, the truth, the principle of truth for a higher good. So, for, for example, I, I would lie to save a life if, if someone pointed a gun at uh, my brother's head or, or at Tony's head or at Teddy's head and said, tell me this guy is red. I, I think I would still consider myself sinning, but I, I would look at that as sort of the lesser of two evils and I would lie to, to save that person's life. But so I want to put it to you guys, though, in the context of sharing the gospel, the gospel truths, um, are there ever any times when it's OK for the Christian to use deceitful tactics or lies to to further the cause of Christ? Or is it just a uh, totally banned? Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll start with you, Tony, and then uh, we can go to Teddy and you can sort of have a back and forth on that. Sure. And that's an excellent question, uh, uh, Dale. I appreciate that. So the question is, it, it boils down to, is there ever a time when a Christian should lie uh, or should it never be done under any circumstances? I, I think there is a precedent in Scripture where when when life is in danger, uh, there are times when people uh, will use uh, deceptive uh, words or deceptive measures in order to save a life. And that seems to be the only 
time that I could see uh, where where there is a degree of misleading. For example, uh, here's two classical biblical examples of what we're talking about. So in the book of Exodus, chapter one, we read about the, the birth of Moses and we, we read about how the, the Pharaoh uh, at the time was fearing that the Hebrews were uh, pop, were growing, their population was considerably growing in comparison to the Egyptians. And the Pharaoh uh, issued a decree that all Hebrew children uh, two years and under should uh, be killed by being thrown into the Nile, the Nile River. And so we read about how the uh, midwives who were assisting the, the Hebrew women who were delivering their children, we are told that the midwives feared God and they, they uh, saved the children from destruction and they would not report the children or hand them over to the Egyptian authorities to have the children uh, killed. So this was an act of infanticide that the Pharaoh had, had declared. And it's interesting that we read there in Exodus chapter one that when the midwives were confronted by the Egyptians, the, the midwives came up with the excuse that, well, you know, these Hebrew women, they're just not like other women because when they go into labor, they just pop these kids like you won't believe. So by the time we get there, the kids are already born and, and they've hidden the child already. So obviously that wasn't true. I mean, they were there, uh, you know, as midwives to help deliver the children, but they were, they were, they were saying something completely different. And then, of course, in the book of Joshua, chapter six, we, we read about how the Israelites were encamping around Jericho to, to take it over. Uh, and then we read about Rahab, the, the, the prostitute there, and how she uh, allowed the, the Hebrew spies to come in with Joshua and to, to scope the city out before they invaded it. And, uh, and so she, she basically let them in. She, she showed them where all the strategic entry points were. And then uh, she let them go on the condition, of course, that they would save her, spare her and her family when they invaded. And, and, and so, uh, and then, but then again, Rahab told everyone else, oh, no, no, I don't know about anything about any Hebrew spies coming into the city. So obviously she, she, she hid that fact. So there have been cases in Christian history uh, where Christians under duress uh, felt that they had to, to lie in order to save a life. Uh, and, and, and the, the, the precedent that life trumps, the law to save life trumps all laws, is even seen in the fact that uh, in the Bible, Jesus, for example, says that if a, if a lamb falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, uh, are you permitted to save its life because you can't work on the Sabbath day? And, and the rabbis had already decided, of course, if a lamb falls into a pit, you, you are obligated to save that lamb's life. Now, of course, that's not involving trickery or, or deceit here. But the point here is that that certain laws can be broken um, to save life. And so lesser laws are broken to save the greater law of protecting life. Another example of this is is in the in the book of First Samuel, where we read about uh, King David with his men. Uh, they were starving and there was no food to eat. And the priests offered him um the, the showbread, the bread of the presence that was only permitted to the Levites and the priests to eat. And yet there's David starving with his men. And even though he's not a Levite, he's not permitted to eat that bread. But because they're at the point of starvation, the priest hands over the bread to them. Uh, because when you really think about it, and here I'm getting a little theological, but the Messianic line was at stake here. If David died, the Messianic line would have died right there. And, and the whole plan of salvation, the the Ordu Saluti that we read about of God, uh, uh, Ordus uh, 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 Salutis, the, the the order of salvation would have been would have been hampered there and, and cut off. Um, and we know that during the Second World War, during the Nazi occupation of Holland, for example, the the Dutch Reformed folks were were really big on not lying under any circumstances, and so there were stories of them hiding Jews under their. Uh, basically, they would cut open something under their table, like they, they would open up the floor and they'd create a little chamber in there so that if the Nazis came banging on the door, these Jews would hide under the table. So there's a story of the, of, of the Nazis coming to this, this Dutch home and saying, do you have any Jews in here? And uh, the, the Christian owner of the house said, yes, they're, they're hiding under the table. And the Nazis looked at him and says, yeah, yeah, funny, funny, funny guy. And then they just went off when, in fact, they were under the table. They, you know, it was just covered with a carpet. Mm -hmm. So 
there are cases where uh, Christians have felt the need to 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 lie uh, in order to save uh, to save a life, and so uh, I think your example is very apropos there, Dale. That if someone put a gun to your head or to Teddy's head and said, you know, uh, uh, is is the sky red or or what uh, or is it is it green? Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely do that to save your life because at the end of the day, he would take you out. And then you take me out. Uh, so now you've got a double homicide. So um, there are cases where uh, the principle is this. The, 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 the law of the sanctity of life, because every human bears the, the image of God, the Imago Dei, because every human bears the image of God, you must at all, uh, at all uh, uh, costs try to save that life. Now, that's very different than Takiya, the Islamic a principle of deception in order to promote Islam. That's a completely different issue. Um, so, yeah, I would say that in some circumstances, and as you know, they are very, very, uh, very uh, uh, marginal uh, that these cases would occur. But in those types of cases, I don't think anybody would be condemned for doing that, for lying to save a life. Gotcha. Well said. All right. Uh, yeah, Teddy, uh, look, same, same question to you. It, are there ever any higher goods like promoting um, a political cause or the or the gospel, sharing you know the gospel cause or the cause of Christ or something or to save a life? Are, are there any circumstances where you think it's okay for Christians to to use lies um, to advance their a higher cause? Um. Well, I first of all want to agree with um, everything Tony said. Uh, I'll second all of that. <laughs> and um, I, I would say I would add another uh, aspect to uh, the mix. And that is that it is important that Christians have credibility when they speak. And when, if and when someone lies, then that uh, hurts the credibility of the message. And, and that's another reason why uh, I think there's, there's a higher duty when one, uh, I don't want to say advertises, but, but if people know that you are a Christian and you are not behaving um, in a good way that puts Christianity in a good light, then many people, even though it's wrong for people to assume that just because someone is not the perfect embodiment of a Christian, that that reflects poorly on 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 the religion, um, the reality of it is that it tends to do just that. And so, um, you know, there, there's a, a duty to, to be a good representative of your faith. And if you lie about your faith or anything else, then that undermines your, your credibility and people uh, a lot of times will tend to uh, lump one's negative characteristics and drag that into perhaps, you know, uh, one's particular faith. And so um, I, I think, and, and plus just people won't trust you if they find out that you've lied to you. It's uh, kind mm -hmm. of human nature, you know, once burnt, twice learnt. So um in terms of uh, with saving a life, I, uh, I certainly agree with that. And Dale, you and I have had this discussion uh, before, uh, and that is the issue of kindness, how sometimes uh, truth can be wielded like a sword and be wielded with the intention of cutting people up and it's all true but it's it it's not being done for a uh, a good or a moral purpose uh or or even just you know let's say uh i'm friends with quasimodo and quasimodo asks me you know do you think i'm i'm attractive 
or or do you think that uh, I'll ever find someone that will go out with me? And let's just say that I'm thinking, well, you know, there's just no way that that's going to be happening. Is it the right thing to be truthful in that situation to 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 crush a person's soul i i just uh i i think that in certain situations when it is not for one's own benefit but it it's uh you know what we usually think of as sort of a white lie it doesn't hurt anybody and it's actually being said to spare someone from unnecessary hurt um i i i think that it's okay and you know and i'll i'll be candid you know even if it if if it turns out that it just plain old isn't okay with God, then, you know, just mark me down as committing that sin. I I just, uh, I'm going to keep doing it in situations when it doesn't really matter. And it is um, showing kindness because to me, Jesus's instruction that uh, we treat our neighbors as we would want to be treated, I would want to be treated that way. You know, I, you know, there are times when, yeah, you know, (laughs) maybe lied to me about, about uh, something, you know, if it's not uh, that important, you know, I tended to ask, I tend to not ask those questions though. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But some people do, you know, (laughs) Fair enough. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So that's sort of an added layer. And and you're right. Yeah. Me and Teddy have uh, discussed that um, a bit before because I, I do. So I, I agree with both Tony's answer uh, completely and the first part of what Teddy uh, said my, myself. I, I think that the when it comes to the context of promoting the gospel truth or promoting Christ's k- kingdom, you can't use deceitful tactics because that will just backfire on, on the cause. We need to be scrupulously honest. Um, mm-hmm. but, but when it comes to saving a life, that's that's justified. Um, yeah, I, I'm supposed to be the host, so I, I shouldn't be giving my opinion. But I, yeah, I, to, Tony, I'll turn it uh, just very quickly before I move to the final question in this section. Um, so, so Teddy adds this notion of telling a white lie to spare someone's feelings you know do it do i look fat uh no you look beautiful or, or something like that it, um what about that it's it's not as important as sharing the gospel message or, or promoting a political cause but you're trying to spare someone's feelings what do you think of that as a christian yeah i think i think that the golden rule that that jesus gave uh, do unto others what you would have them do unto you mm-hmm. uh, i think should apply um and also, I mean, let's face it, um, uh, when it comes to appearances, whether you're talking about a human appearance or, you know, do you think do you think uh, a vulture is, is a good looking bird? Well, personally, I don't think a vulture is the most attractive looking bird, not as majestic and glorious as an eagle, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that when it comes to appearances, uh, if 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 you don't want to hurt someone's feelings, that's understandable. But if someone asks you, well, do you think I'm fat or not? Um, I mean, to, to, to be objective about it, uh, what, what, what would be your motive in, in giving this objective answer and saying, yeah, I think you're fat, but well, what exactly, what exactly does that mean? Are you overweight? Are you on the, are you on that, are you on that cusp line where you could be endangering your health or, or so forth and so on? Um, I think we do have to consider the person's feelings. I, you know, Philippians 2, 5, Paul says, uh, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, uh, who esteemed others better than himself. We, we think of the other first. Um, but if someone is saying, look, you know, do, do you think that uh, I'm overweight? I think for us to say, no, you look just great is just as is also not being you're not being truthful with yourself. Uh, I mean, I've never been asked that question, I, I guess. Uh, with guys, it's a little different because guys can take it. But of course, you know, uh, it's an issue, of course, that that could hurt 
a woman's feelings, for example. I mean, a lot is demanded of women in our society, uh, how they look and, and, and how, they, how they dress themselves and, and so forth and so on. Um, but, at, but I guess at, cert, at a certain point, you, I think you need to n- not deceive or mislead, but I think you need to temper your words mm. with grace. You could say, look, you know, um, I'm trying to lose weight myself and, and, and I don't want to, my doctors told me about high cholesterol and I don't want to put my life in danger and, and I don't want to, you know, leave this world early, leave my kids behind, my wife and so forth and so on. So it's a very interesting question, but I think we need to temper that with, with uh, reasonableness and, and, you know, you don't just come right out and say, yeah, you're all beast. You're, you need, you know, you need uh, PX90 or, or something of that nature. So I think it's one of those case to case situations here. It's a situational ethical question. Um, but definitely being deceptive to make someone feel better, I don't think is the answer either. Um, so it's kind of a complicated, complicated question, really. You know, I, uh, I was thinking about uh, another aspect of it, and that is um, the importance of, you know, if somebody's asked a question, oh, what do you think of my dress? Uh, that I'm, you know, for the prom, for the high school prom. Well, sometimes it's important that we discern whether somebody is really asking for our opinion, our honest yes. opinion, or whether they're fishing for a compliment. Because I will tell you, um, every time, I, I don't, I mean, it's extremely rare when, I am asked the question of, hey, what do you think about so-and-so when it's someone who is truly asking for constructive criticism? You know, 9.9 times out of 10, it's fishing for a compliment. They need a little right. reinforcement. And, and then the other thing that I think it's important to factor in is whether there is the opportunity for the person to to change what they've done. So, I, for example, I've been in situations where, let's say, a person before they have purchased a dress, they will ask me, oh, which one do you like better, this one or that one? Or, you know, and so they haven't made a decision yet. And so, you know, sure, you know, say what you what you think. But when somebody asks, what do you think of my dress? And it's at, you know, the 11th hour before prom and there's no time for them to, you know, chuck, you know, the hideous dress and, and get another one. Well, then if you tell them, man, I think that's just the ugliest thing I've ever seen, then they now have the knowledge that if you think that what they're wearing is just so horrible and that they will be going to that prom in that dress, or maybe they won't even go to the prom because now, uh, you know, you've insulted them so and they're so self-conscious. And so... Um, when there's no chance to, uh, for a person to take you up on your suggestion, then, you know, that might be a bigger reason to sometimes just tell people what they want to hear, especially if there's nothing that can be done to, to remedy the situation. And there, and there's also the lure to gossip when people say, well, what do you think about her or. Or what do you think about what he did? Or and, and again, there's always the there's always that the specter of of gossip where you know the Bible also speaks of gossip as a sin, and mm-hmm. of course gossiping is is destroying someone's character behind their back with other people. Something that we wouldn't say in front of them, we're saying to someone else. So uh, I, and I think some of those questions are 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 sometimes asked in order to 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 engage in in gossip mm-hmm. uh, and, and demeaning mm-hmm. someone else or. Or, or speaking ill of them. So, yeah, I think that uh, sometimes the questions that are asked are sometimes asked for the purpose of, of gloating in, in gossip itself. Right. And, and, you know, and that, that made me think of one other thing, and that is that um, 
just so you know, in about two minutes, if you can wrap up in two minutes, because I want to make sure I can fit in um, the other topics in time. Uh, but oh, but yes, finish, yes. Your, finish your thought for a little um, So it was just um, that if, if somebody asks you for your opinion and, the, you know, what you have to say is uh, possibly very insulting, where you don't like something that they've done or some choice that they've made. But it's important to uh, prevent bad things from happening to them by telling them the truth to keep them from, you know, having some sort of a disaster. Then, you know, a person does need to, to step up uh, and say sometimes, terribly painful truths in order to protect a person from a, a possibly a possibly worse uh, situation by you know you know wearing some ridiculous outfit that is going to destroy their reputation or something like that you know then yeah you know that might be the time to or that that is the time to to speak up with with candid opinions that might be hurtful Perfect. All right. Um, yeah, a excellent conversation, you two. I, I think you guys raised great points on, on that issue. Um, now, I, I want to transition to the the second major topic of focus. Um, so that that's going to be not just truth, but Christian ethics and Christian morality in, in this secular age. And, you know, obviously in today's culture, you, you guys have sort of hinted at this already, we're, we're seen as backwards, you know, get rid of your Bibles. Why, why are you using... Uh, what's the phrase, an Iron Age primitive book to teach you about how to live a moral life. You should be using modern secular moral principles and, and this sort of thing. And, you know, we, we come up with issues like the LGBT community, transgenderism, abortion. We're, we're just, Christians are just seen as being so behind the times and, and immoral by the secular culture. So yeah, just, I just wanted to throw it to you guys. And uh, for this topic, I'll start uh, with you, Teddy, uh, in, in about 10 minutes for an opening speech. Um, what do you see about the, the issues of Christian ethics and how should Christians go about um, living Christian moral lives in a, in a secular age? I think that uh, it's important that we are true to our beliefs and the teaching, the teachings that we get from uh, God through the Bible. And uh, I think that it's also important that we emulate what God does with us. And that is that God, uh, has enough respect for us that he gives us free will and he doesn't try to force his rules upon us. So um, I, I do uh, value liberty and uh, I do not believe that, uh, that I, generally speaking, have a right to impose my ideas on others. Um, and, and so, for example, with, you know, the LGBTQ community, I can't help it that the Bible does not look favorably upon a homosexual lifestyle. I didn't make those rules. Um, and I am not choosing to be a Christian because it's uh, a choice in the sense that I'm trying to figure out what to have uh, at a restaurant. I'm looking at the menu and let's see which one I prefer. I, I'm a Christian because I believe that uh, the Christian God is, is real. And, um, and so that's not uh, a choice. I, I, I believe that, um, that the evidence supporting uh, 
his, his being real is is very very strong and and is uh, very supported, especially with the scientific and historical evidence, like with the Shroud of Turin and history. Uh, and so it's not a choice for me, uh, you know, because as we were saying earlier, truth is, it's, it's not a, we don't have a choice between what the truth is. It is, and it's just a question of whether we recognize it. So um, because God does not have a, a favorable impression of a homosexual lifestyle, I can't pretend that hey god doesn't care i mean no you know if people can point out parts of the bible that argue differently i'm open because i i have friends who are are gay and that i care about and i really don't care what a person's uh you know what their particular persuasion is um and so uh, I'm certainly not going to uh, try to, uh, to badger or harass or try to restrict the freedoms of, um, of someone who uh, is in the LGBTQ community. But I, I can't uh, be hypocritical and say that I think that the Bible thinks it's okay. And, and for those, and, and there are many people in the LGBTQ community who are religious. And um, my answer to that is just, you know, worst case scenario, stay with your religion and be as religious as you can be. And, you know, we are all sinners and there are plenty of sins that heterosexuals commit that are on the same plane as homosexual behavior. And, and just uh, in terms of having sex outside of wedlock, that's, that's right there on the same plane uh, from, from everything I've ever read. And so, uh, and there are plenty of heterosexuals doing that that don't get uh, pressured by a lot of uh, of the Christian community. So, uh, so I just I, I, that that's one of those situations that I think it's so hard because I, I do believe that um, that most people who are gay are born that way and. Uh, you can't choose who you're attracted to. And I, I think that, um, and there are lots of things that we feel like, you know, hey, I might like to gamble. It's like, that, you know, that's not a good thing. So you don't do it. Or I might like this or that, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so, yes, we refrain from doing things that are vices, but uh, to, to tell a person who is gay uh, that you've got to spend the rest of your life um, faking, uh, you know, being in love or, or just kind of being, not having an optimal uh, relationship with somebody, that's, that's a pretty big uh, sacrifice. And I... I can understand, uh, and I have uh, just a tremendous amount of sympathy to people who were put in that situation, and I, I can understand why so many of them uh, do not. And uh, and all I can say is that uh, you know I, I just don't leave Christianity because of that no look and seek what is true and in the same way that none of us meet all of the criteria that god sets out for us none of us meet that and as we are all sinners you know join the rest of us and and we still acknowledge 
uh, the validity and the truth of, of uh, God and, and Jesus as our savior. And so uh, it, 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 is a, it is taking things to another level to say, and not, not only that, but it's hypocritical to say, well, oh, just because uh, Christianity doesn't endorse something that I like, oh, well now, whereas I used to believe in, in God, now I'm just going to not believe in God so that I don't have any uh, you know, cognitive dissonance. And to me, I, I see a lot of that going on with politics, and especially in the area of abortion, where, oh, I don't want to have a baby, so uh, yeah, life's not that valuable if it's growing in your body, because hey, that's hamstringing my career or, or whatever. It's going to yeah. be hard. It's like, well, you know, you can't choose what's right and wrong based on what is um, convenient for you. All right. Uh, yeah, Teddy. Uh, uh, sorry, Tony. Uh, I'll turn it to you. Sure. In, in 10 minutes or less. Um, okay. Because uh, I, I know you've spoken on things about like the, the, I think you called it the transverse values. Um System. Yeah. What, what do you make of this morality? Yeah. Issue? Yeah. I mean, I think I think we need to begin by by stating that the truth, because truth is uh, truth as an attribute of God. And, and there's no there's no surprise here that God's name, Yahweh, in the Hebrew text, in the Hebrew Bible means he who is the, the I am the great I am. And and because truth is 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 an attribute of God, then truth necessarily is eternal. In other words, truth is a constant. Truth is not dependent. It's not, truth is not a contingent entity depending on something else for its existence. Truth is necessary, like just like numbers are necessary entities and, and God would be considered a necessary being. Two plus two, a very simple formula, two plus two equals four, of course, has always been true since the dawn, of the dawn of time, and it's still true, and it will be true when you and I and Teddy are gone, and it will be true when the universe ceases to be. It will always be true. But that very equation is now being spoken of by, by the social leftists as something that is part of white patriarchy, that the white patriarchal system created the idea of mathematics, and, and they created the idea of science because of the the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, these were all uh, white uh, social constructions. And so now there are people saying two and two equals four is a, is a white supremacist idea. This is the lunacy that we've gone down to. And that's because if we reject objective moral values, that there is such a thing as objective morality, that there are certain things that are absolutely right and absolutely wrong, uh, we will we will uh, simply fall back into subjectivism and relativism, where where your idea of right is just as good as everyone else's idea. Well, that of course we've seen examples of that in human history, and it's led to absolute catastrophe and disaster uh, in in world history. So, number one, truth is is objective. Truth is not something that is within us. It's not something that man created or man designed. It is something that was Let's put it this way: it was it was understood, it was recovered, it was it was recognized. It's something that you recognize, and because truth is eternal and objective, then that means that the source of truth itself, which we believe to be God, is also eternal. Therefore, His words are eternal. Jesus could say, "Heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will never pass away." The Bible says that the the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever, and therefore. God's word revealed in time in history. Yes, it was the New Testament was 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 canonized 2000 years ago and and the Old Testament uh, before that 1400 years or so uh, 1300 years before Christ with Moses and then the prophets and so forth. But this is the issue just because the book is an ancient book, it does not logically follow that its statements of truth are are now passe. Uh, when the Bible makes a truth claim, it is always true. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder. These are ethical truths that have been form the part of the formation of, of, of all ancient societies, as far as we know. Um, and, and so the word of God 
uh, the statements that God issues forth about truth will eternally be true. So this brings us to the question of morality and ethics. Well, who does who defines us in terms of identity? Who determines what it is to be human? And who determines our sexual gender? Well, the Bible says that God created humans in his image, and it says male and female, he created them. And he, he not only created the male and female, but he created the first, uh, the first uh, institution that God established was marriage, which has been the foundational principle of all humanity. And the very, the very foundation of society was marriage and the nuclear family, all of which are under attack today by the left, including sexual gender. And so today, the left will tell you that gender is socially constructed. The Bible says that gender is biological and that that, that declaration of, of the human species as male and female is intricately connected to man's identity as God's very image, as the image bearer of his creator. And therefore, God defines his image as binary, male and female, not as non-binary, but as binary, male and female. And so if marriage is, is, is a sacred institution that God established, that a man would leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one, and through that union they would be able to procreate and propagate the human species. That is the only way we can propagate the human species is through the male and female union in marriage. And then, uh, of course, God points out through his word that violations of that union, whether it be bestiality, whether it be homosexuality, whatever it may be, uh, God defines those parameters. God tells us that any violation of that sexual union is an abomination before him. And so the danger in our society is to follow our feelings and 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 then believe that our feelings justify our actions. And so, for example, we were talking earlier about same sex attraction. OK, a, a man feels sexually attracted to another man. Uh, a female feels sexually attracted to another female. But there's also men who feel sexually attracted to children. And it is now being argued by academics uh, that. Uh, pedophilia, they're trying to get rid of the word pedophilia because it, it has such a, a bad connotation. They are now proposing that we redefine men and women to some extent, but primarily men, as MAP, M-A-P, which is an acronym for minor attracted person, uh, persons. In other words, there is a move now by Western academia, not all, but some, to remove pedophilia from the American uh, Psychiatric Association's list of mental disorders, which they also did in the 1960s by removing homosexuality from that list. Now they're moving to remove uh, minor attracted persons or pedophiles from that list as well. And the arguments are the same. We were born that way. We're wired that way. Uh, I don't choose to be attracted to children. I just am. But on that basis, what we're virtually doing is endorsing the sexual exploitation of children predicated not on moral law, but predicated on someone's feelings. Now, the Bible is the only text that tells us that the reason why we have these skewed feelings, these immoral impulses in us, is because we are born sinful creatures. The, the Bible says that, that all have sinned and come short of God's glory. And Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, and who can know it? And what that tells me is that the impulse of the human heart is not to obey God. The Bible is very clear that the impulse of the human heart is to love our sin and to gratify our needs. And therefore, the Bible will say that those who are in the flesh that is following their sinful nature, the Greek word is sarx, those who follow their flesh cannot please God. And therefore, it necessitated the coming of the sinless, spotless Son of God into the world to pay the debt that we could not pay because we are sin break, we're lawbreakers, we violate God's law, we have we violated the court of God's justice, and the only reparations that can be made is that Christ comes and Christ pays that debt for us. He pays the penalty that was due to us. And, and, and therefore, it's important to realize here that what human beings feel is morally right is 
is something that is, again, predicated, according to the Bible, on our sinful impulses. And that's why God has to change us. And, and yes, it's very true that many Christians today, uh, for example, uh, uh, people claiming to be Christians and they're sleeping with their girlfriends or vice versa, the Bible refers to this as, as, as parneia. The Greek word parneia is a word that, that where we get the word pornography from. It's a word that has a general broad scope that means sexual immorality. And as a pastor, I, I, I warn uh, uh, my people that if you continue in Parnea, the Bible says very clearly, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And that applies to not just Parnea, it applies to uh, adultery as well. It applies to homosexual behavior. And Jesus put it this way. If you want to follow me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And what does that mean? It means at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about your needs. It's not about your proclivities. It is about surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that means he comes first. So I have uh, friends who are uh, gay uh, who have found Christ. And some of them have moved on. The, some of them have married and now have children, live uh, fulfilling lives in, in the marriage covenant. But then there are others who, yeah, they struggle uh, with same-sex attraction. But they know they're not going there because they know this, this violates God's law. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it's not about their needs. It's about obedience to Christ, which involves sacrifice, taking up that cross, following. And what does that mean? Well, those who carried their crosses were those who were going to their deaths. And so Christ calls us to die to ourselves, to abandon what we think is necessary in our lives and to put him first. Uh, and so just as someone who has an, an alcoholic addiction of the past, you don't go to a bar in other words you don't walk on slippery surface surfaces because if you don't want to walk if you don't want to fall avoid slippery surfaces and the same goes for porn addiction you don't uh, go places where there's pornographic material and so forth so the christian life is a life of surrender it's a life of inner co conflict between again you know god's law and our proclivities but it's not it's not an easy walk i'm not saying that this is an easy walk but it is a walk of surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Tony, uh, uh, Dale, you mind if I ask Tony a question? Yep, sure. I, I've got a couple of my my own, but uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, I was just wondering because you know I I do find uh, I mean there are lots of uh, different things that uh, are prohibited, but you know to for someone to have to deny um, being with the gender that you know that they are attracted to. That that's a pretty uh, big one, and so mm. I I I have just tremendous sympathy for people in that situation. And one of the things that I've thought about, and I'm curious as to your take on this. Uh, and that is if, if someone just, you know, because because there are lots of people who were bisexual. And so, you know, they can still, uh, you know, be happy with the opposite sex. It just might be that they might, you know, as they're married, they might find the same sex attractive, too. But then it's just mm -hmm. a question of staying faithful. <clears throat> but. Uh, but for those who just are repulsed by the opposite sex. Uh, what do you think about this approach in, in or in that, uh, you know, if you believe that Jesus is your savior, then that is supposed to guarantee you heaven, but then there's judgment. And my understanding is that that then determines what the extent of your rewards are in heaven. And so for the people who are homosexual or fornicators or adulterers or, mm -hmm. you know, this, that and the other, because, you know, again, it's not like that's the only uh, right. sin out there. Right. But, um, you know, isn't it if if they 
have Jesus as their savior, doesn't that get them into heaven? Because I do believe in hell. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I don't ex know exactly what it is, but, you know, I think most Christians believe in, in hell, that it's something that, you know, clearly is to be avoided. Uh, and so just, I'm just uh, wondering for, for people who are, are in the LGBT community who just, you know, are not willing to sacrifice who they want to love uh, because I keep saying, you know, just stay with Christianity and just let the chips fall where they may. I mean, we're, we all have sins. And so just, you know, stick with it. Uh, so what are your thoughts in terms of that? It, that it still gives them salvation from hell. Uh, but it's just, you know, a question of what, what your rewards are. Yeah, I, I think an, an important aspect of, of the Christian life, and Christianity is not fire insurance. It's not saying if you become a Christian, you know, you'll you'll uh, you'll just you won't go to hell and, and you'll be saved from that. There is a component to the Christian life. It's not just talking. It's walking the talk. And so the Bible talks about Jesus says, whoever hears my words and, and does them is like a man who built his house on a rock and then the, the rains came and the storm came and, and it beat about the house, but the house did not fall because it was built on the rock. And then he says, but those who hear my words and don't do them, who don't obey what I say, they built the house on the sand. And then when the storms come and so forth, uh, it, it knocks the house down and washes it away. And Jesus says, and great was the destruction thereof. And so the Christian life is not just saying, well, I believe in Jesus as my savior. The Bible says faith without works is dead. And if you claim to have faith and you don't live out that faith by your works, and then uh, the Bible says that faith is is counterfeit. It's not genuine faith. So what I don't want to do is give people false hope into thinking that as long as you believe in Jesus, this is your ticket out of hell. I want them to realize that Jesus says, if you love me, he says, you shall keep my commandments. And therefore, if if we love Jesus Christ, and, and we follow Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is, is faith and hope and love. And there's these various outworkings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that doesn't mean we won't struggle with sin. I, the Bible nowhere says that, that we live a sin-free life here, uh, this side of heaven. But we ought to sin less. We're not sinless, but we ought to sin less. And therefore, as we walk with Christ uh, in, this, in this world, um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, in your heritage, uh, Teddy, being Greek, mm -hmm. this was a great discipline of the Greek fathers, of many of the Greek fathers, even St. Antony of the Desert, who went out into the desert to, 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 to live this life of total, uh, this life of total uh, surrender to Jesus Christ. And, and one of the things that these Greek fathers taught us was that, um, was that following Christ was not just following him by word, but, but by following him in action. And what that means is we are going to struggle. And that's what the meaning of the cross is. To carry that cross means you're going, there is an element of suffering in this world. Uh, and, and that means the, 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 uh, the, the total abandonment of our sins. There's also the, the element of a confession. The Bible says that we, are, if we confess our sins. He is just, Christ is just and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us. And so I'm not trying to say, Look, the, the, the person with same-sex attraction isn't going to go through the struggle. They are. But if a, if a man has sexual uh, attraction to children, uh, that is something he or she should not be doing. And, and, uh, and at the same time, there are Christians, there are Christians who struggle with these, uh, these attraction to children, and, and they are fighting that and keeping it at bay. So what I'm trying to say is this, two wrongs don't make a right. God has told us that, that homosexual behavior is sinful. Uh, uh, Jesus includes it under the, the heading of pernea, uh, which means sexual immorality. And the Bible is very clear that, that no homosexual, uh, one who practices homosexuality or one who is the active agent or the passive agent in, in the sexual act, the Bible is very clear that those who do these things will not inherit God's kingdom. And and so this brings us back to, again, speaking the truth in love. Um, and, and what that means is if, if, if someone str struggles with same-sex attraction, that's the same thing in the Bible as struggling with lust, uh, struggling with pornography, 
struggling with anger to the point that you want to kill somebody. Jesus defined that as murder in your heart and so forth. So by no means am I ever saying that this is not a hard call. This is a hard pill to swallow, but it's worth it because we are born into this world as broken people. The Bible uh, says that we come into this world as broken. We're in Adam and we need to come mm-hmm. into Christ. And therefore, as broken people, uh, we need salvation. That's why Christ came. But it, it doesn't mean that, well, because my feelings orient me towards someone of the same sex, it therefore follows that it is legitimate. I, again, I don't think two wrongs make a right here. And at the end of the day, it, it's God's moral law that we are subject to. But you now, what about how there, I don't know what the particular passage is, I bet you do, uh, where it talks about how, uh, you know, God, the Bible wants to make it clear that we get to heaven by way of God's grace, not by Mm -hmm. our works. I mean, because I know that there are kind of some conflicting passages on whether, uh, you know, a lot of times Catholics emphasize the work aspect but then right. there's the other aspect that say you cannot earn your way into heaven. Right. That it is strictly right. through grace. And and like with the whole fire insurance thing, right. I I think that God recognizes if, for example, an atheist just uh, you know right on their deathbed says just mouths the words. Okay, I believe in God and Jesus, so uh, you know, save me from hell. Versus when someone uh, genuinely believes that and has that in their heart. I mean, it it's like if if you genuinely believe it. Uh, I mean, to me, it it seems like it it is fire insurance. I mean. But again, it shouldn't be done uh, strictly for that purpose. Right. And, right. and I think God knows the difference. That Right. Well, the Bible is very clear that it is by grace alone that we are saved because there's nothing you or I could do to satisfy God's justice. That is, in the court of justice, of God's court of justice, there's nothing. We can't pay the fine. We cannot pay uh, the debt that we have to, to satisfy it. The, the 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 justice of the court here, the heavenly court. And therefore, Christ comes and Christ pays the penalty because as the God-man, as the Son of God, second person of the Trinity, the God-man takes it upon himself to to bear the penalty for us. And the whoever uh, trusts in him, Christ becomes their advocate. And you being a lawyer know the whole concept of being an advocate and advocacy for your, for your clients. Christ, be, I become Christ's client and he becomes my advocate. He's not only my advocate, he pays the penalty. He's my great high priest who pays the penalty for, for my sin. But here's an important component. When, when, when Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Everyone, everyone tends to forget the following verse. And he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has uh, beforehand uh, appointed that we should do. And so what the Bible points out is that it is faith alone that saves, but faith that saves is not alone. It is accompanied by by good works. And so St. Paul tells us in Romans 6 that where where some Christians thought, well, you know, we're saved by grace. We might as well sin all the more so that more grace may abound. And Paul says, uh, may it never be. How could you live in sin if you've died to sin? And he reminds them of their baptism, how in baptism we were buried with Christ and we were raised with Christ into a new life. And he says, look, you've died to sin. We are called to live unto righteousness. And so this is one of the the greatest uh, misapprehensions or urban legends of Christianity is that it's just this this grace only religion. Grace alone only applies to our salvation because we're not capable of saving ourselves. But those who are redeemed by God do produce these good works. And so, for example, use the example of an atheist on their deathbed. No, no atheist is inclined. No one is inclined to turn to God. The Bible says there is no one who seeks God. There is no one who fears God. I believe that the only reason why people are inclined to turn towards God is God regenerates their hearts. He changes their hearts. I'm thinking of the, good, the thief on the cross. 
who turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus says, uh, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, here is an act of God's grace where God uh, softens the heart of this, this thief on a cross. And he turns to, to Christ for, for mercy without any works. And he's, he's saved on his deathbed, so to speak. Uh, so I, I think Christianity is not a just, oh, God, God saved me by grace. And grace becomes a license to sin. Absolutely not. The Bible is very clear. We cannot live in sin because we have died to sin in Jesus Christ. And therefore, well, yeah. And I don't, I don't necessarily mean a license to sin. It would be, you know, once you're in that, uh, that the grace gets you to heaven. Mm. Uh, but then the judgment ends up determining what, uh, what your rewards are that I, I have, my understanding is that not everybody gets the same rewards in heaven. And so, you know, there's, oh, there's judgment see. that yeah. goes well, on in terms yeah. of, uh, yeah. so the people that, that sure. uh, haven't done a whole lot of good works. But the, the other thing where you were saying about the passage where we're created to do good, to do good works, that. I didn't hear in there as I was kind of putting my lawyer ears on. I didn't <laughs> hear anything in there that said that heaven is contingent upon the good works. So, yes, you can be created for good works, but, you know, just because you were created doesn't mean, you know, for yeah. good works doesn't mean you're going yeah. to. But that doesn't say that. Uh, there's going to be a penalty if well, you don't well, do let, them. If you if you don't mind, if I let me qualify that. Paul is not talking about everyone there. You know, this isn't. I mean, universalism is a heresy that the church has always historically rejected. That everyone's going to heaven. The Bible. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the church has always rejected universalism, except for some heretics. I mean, Origen tried to bring it back, and and, and there have been some universalists in in history that have been rejected by the church. But but my point here is Paul's not referring to you know, the, the universal human race there. He's referring to those that God has called in Christ from the foundation of the world. And and this this of course is this brings up the whole question of election, where God elects his people. Mm -hmm. And th and therefore in Ephesians 1, 1, 4 and 6, Paul goes on about in him we were predestined to be his sons through adoption in Christ Jesus. He he predestined us in love. And Paul's talking about those who are in Christ. And that's why Paul uses the language of in Adam and in Christ. And, and those who were created to do good works are those who are in Christ, those who are saved, those who are redeemed. And the, the penalties there, like you were talking about re being rewarded for good works, that this, is, this is a completely different judgment than the judgment of the last day, the final judgment. The, the judgment of good works is, 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 is something Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter five there, and he he uses the Greek word, and 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 you being Greek probably will will resonate with this. But Paul uses the Greek word bima, bima, and and the bima uh, in 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 the first century was the the judgment seat of the Olympic judge. And as you know, the Greeks gave us uh, great philosophy, but they also gave us the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the Olympic, the, the the Olympic judge is the one who would confer. Uh, rewards on, of course, the athletes, um, gold, silver, uh, the way we have it today with gold, silver, bronze, and so mm -hmm. forth. That has to do with that has to do with rewards for Christian conduct. That, uh, th th that has nothing to do with losing salvation and, and being deprived of salvation. That is something for the final day. That, that the Bible refers to that as the the Book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, the the last book of the Bible. The the, the judgment where God will judge all the wicked uh, and then throw them into the Gehenna, the lake of fire. So what Christians are judged for is, is not their, their, their works uh, of righteousness or unrighteousness. It's what they do for Christ, what they do for the kingdom. And so that's why the language Paul uses there, the word bima, refers to the, 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 the judgment for, of, for rewards. Uh, so that that is something very different than the judgment uh, of the last day where God uh, sentences uh, the wicked to eternal separation from him. Ah, very interesting. Thank you for yes. explaining you're, that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Um, so uh, just for the sake of time, I, I had two questions here, but um, I'll, I'll just split it up. I'll, I'll ask one to each of you and, you know, if you can answer in five minutes or less and then we'll move on to the 
to the next section to make sure I'm I'm over in in terms of Tony's uh, suggested time limit. So, okay. So the the first question uh, will be for you, Teddy. Um, so I'll split these up. So so just very quickly, Teddy. Uh, do you think that so so you've admitted that we have to follow the Bible. You can't just um, follow your own feelings and that sort of thing. That the Bible says homosexuality is wrong, therefore it's wrong. Fornication is wrong, therefore it's wrong. Um, do you think that Christians have the right to impose their Christian morality on non-Christians? Like, should I should I be trying to go to the government to ban gay marriage or to to get rid of abortion or something like that? Um, yeah, what what should Christians do in terms of uh, getting non-Christians to follow mor our morality? I think with um, with certain types of morality that do not involve the harming of others. I think that uh, we should follow God's lead and let people exercise their, their free will in, in what they want to do and uh, stay out of it. And, but in, in cases, for example, with abortion, there's a, there's another party there that I'm sure probably would love to experience uh, life with all of its joys and hardships, and uh, and so I I have always been uh, very very pro life because uh, you know again just kind of following uh, the golden rule. If I were that baby, I would like to have the chance to live. And so I, I think, you know, it's incumbent upon all of us to assume that every baby would love to um, experience life. And it's not it's not our right to uh, get in the way of that. And I believe that that uh, women, you know, have well, barring being raped, uh, the choice that women have in terms of, uh, you know, being certain that they don't get pregnant is they choose whether or not they have sex. And if you, if it would just absolutely devastate your life to, um, to have a baby, well, there's a surefire way to prevent that. And, uh, again, barring, you know, being raped. Uh, and of course, there's all sorts of birth control. Um, so, uh, you know, that's that's the choice. And in the situations, uh, the, the extremely sensitive situation of um, when a woman is raped, it does not lessen the value of the baby that is in utero. That baby is still given the same value as every other baby. The sa it's, it's endowed with the same dignity, the same worth. And so, you know, unless it's a life or death situation for the mother, when then one can use a self-defense argument, I, I think it's uh, extremely sad that a rape victim would have you know, have to still go through with the pregnancy. But the truth of the matter is that a rape victim is probably not going to be very well emotionally, especially the first year anyway. And if, and then there's also the psychological damage that happens to so many women when they abort um, their child, the feelings of guilt that haunt them. So uh, it's just a bad situation. There, you know, we have victims of crime that, of all sorts of crimes, that don't have a way to lessen their pain. And I think that that this is one of those situations where there's not an uh, a a way to lessen and the pain through the aborting of the, of the child. Perfect. Okay. All right. And and Tony, uh, to you, if you can answer in five minutes or less, so we can move to the sure. to the last topic. Sure. But, 
Um, so hopefully, this is kind of a technical thing, but the, are, are you familiar? There, there are apologists like Randall Rouser, who I've, who I've had on my show, and there are a couple Christians in, in my own audience who, um, unlike all of us, they, they don't even care about what the Bible says uh, about homosexuality homosexuality or abortion or christian ethics and they will say those are not inspired because we have the love hermeneutic they use this kind of overarching principle that jesus was about love he jesus it's unloving to teach against homosexuality so they they use this overarching principle of love to invalidate bible verses so i i just wanted you to kind of re respond to christians who who think this way is this a proper approach or yeah sure well yeah randall rouser also blocked me on one of his blogs because uh we got into this <laughs> similar oh. discussion and uh and, and and what you find here these are elements of, of what we call the emerging church and it's a it's an insidious movement that uh i've called it out back in the 90s late 90s early 2000s that the uh the emergent church is basically a uh a a leftist liberal version of social justice in, in Christian garb. And basically what it is, it's a denial of biblical authority, biblical inspiration. Uh, they don't believe the Bible is uh, necessarily inspired or even inerrant in its original documents. And because of that, it's something similar to what Bruxy Cavey uh, advocates as well, that the Bible is not the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. And, and therefore, and, and to some extent, uh, uh, Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son, uh, and the problem with this, of course, is that you are you they by rejecting the authority of Scripture, Scripture no longer becomes the court of the Supreme Court. The 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 Scriptures become this uh, cultural relative text uh, writ, written by ancient people. And uh, Jesus said, "Love is the greatest thing in in the, in the commandments of God." And therefore, uh, love means you don't pass judgment on people, and so forth, and so on. So. That is an abandonment of, of, of biblical authority. That is an abandonment of what has always been understood in the, his, in the history of the church as uh, our moral manual. The ma manual of the church has always been the scriptures. And of course, the, the whole Protestant uh, Reformation uh, model of sola scriptura, that scripture alone is the ultimate authority of the church. And so I see these men as doing a great disservice to the church. I, I see these men as, um, I don't think that, the emerging Christian movement is going to be around for too long because it's simply going to morph into what we see going on in the progressive left and, and, and so forth. And so it's basically a, a it's a basically a social justice version of Christianity. And that's why I think that uh, it's attractive to many because it doesn't deal with this this idea of, a, of an objective morality. But just getting very quickly to your previous point that you made about uh, about uh, justice cases where the church should get involved and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, God has made himself known, according to Romans 1, God has made himself known to all humanity in, in that God has placed his moral law in the conscience of every human being. And that is because we are God's image. We, we, we have his image and God has implanted uh, the knowledge of himself in us. And therefore, even though humanity, uh, unlike the Jews who had the scriptures and they had the, the, the written law, God gave them the Ten Commandments and so forth, Paul says, uh, but you guys know the precepts of the law because they're written in your hearts. You know them. And, and when it comes to the issues of the sanctity of life, like abortion, I think this is an issue the church should speak against and press the government for. Because, again, we mentioned this earlier, the sanctity of life is paramount in Scripture. And that includes the life of the unborn. That includes the life of the disabled. And that includes the life of the elderly, especially here in Canada with physician-assisted suicide. And, of course, the whole issue of euthanasia. Um, so issues of that nature, I think we should also speak towards the sanctity of marriage, which which has been unraveled uh, in our in our in our secular governments. And so there is a, a sense in which Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. The church, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so in one sense, the, the church is this seasoning agent, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and I do believe in the separation of, of church and state as well, even though we're, this is more of an American uh, description in their laws, uh, we also re respect the authorities. Romans 13, Paul says, respect the authorities because no authority exists outside of God. But the, the fine line, the dividing line is when the authorities 
violate God's moral law. And that's where what we see going on in abortion, the whole question of marriage. Um, we also see it in, in, the, in the government's attempts to stifle free speech in the church or try to control what is spoken of in the church. So many years ago, the mayor of Houston, Texas, uh, actually demanded that she see what what pastors were preaching. She wanted to look at their sermon notes to see if they were speaking against uh, same-sex relations and so forth. Uh, that is something that happens in a fascist, socialist, communist country. That is something that 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 should be unthinkable in a free republic like the United States. Uh, but we have seen these these attempts by government to try to infringe on uh, on the on the on the rights of of, of religious establishments. All right. So uh, as promised, we'll, we'll move to the, the last section here. And, and this is really focusing on uh, things that I know Teddy will be happy to, to speak on. But uh, it, it's the notion of, OK, what is the we, we've kind of discussed that Christian ethics and, and notions are at, at odds with our secular culture and our secular government uh, on many occasions. So uh, I guess in the first place, I'll just ask, what what is the role of the Christian? Um, should, should we become monks, run to the desert so that we can be safe and, and live um, out our Christian lives without being interfered with or interfering with them? Or uh, should we engage with society, participate in the political process? Um, can, can we engage in civil disobedience when we when we disagree uh, with the authorities? Um, yeah, what what is the role for a Christian in relation to a, um, a a secular government that is sometimes hostile to Christian beliefs? And uh, I'll start with Tony on this round. Uh, yeah, I I think that I think I <clears throat> I answered that partially when I said that where Jesus says we are the salt of the earth, the church is to be the salt of the earth, and, and to be the light of the world. And so basically what we're dealing with here, I'm going to use a little bit of St. Augustine's uh, rhetoric. St. Augustine spoke about the Civite Dei, the city of God, and the Civite Mundum, the, the city of the world. And so these two cities, obviously, uh, are existing in tandem with each other. But, of course, they, they, they are also in, in tension with each other. So uh, the rule of law is to be respected and established because scripture tells us all authority comes from God, even the authority of wicked people to rule, that right of, of governance comes from God, whether you're talking about uh, monarchical or, or a constitutional republic like the United States, ours is a constitutional monarchy as a commonwealth nation, even communist rulers uh, like uh, the, the, the president of the, of the Chinese Communist Party, his right to rule comes from God, that authority comes from God. How they use that authority they will be accountable for. I think that uh, that uh, the separation of church and state, which is a common heritage of the Protestant Reformation, particularly the Anabaptist movement within the Reformation, the later Reformation, mm -hmm. uh, maintains that the, that church and state have to be kept separate, that that the government cannot impose on the church, but at the same time, the church cannot take over the government because what you end up with is something like you see in Islamic countries, where you have these theocracies, where uh, there, there's no separation of religion and politics. It all comes together. And so we have seen in history that some, some of these theocratic governments have ended up in, in absolute disaster. I'm thinking particularly of the, the Anabaptist movement in Munster, Germany, where they, they basically created an autonomous zone and, and became tyrants and so forth. Um, but at the same time, the Bible tells us, I'm quoting now from Acts 5.29, where the apostles Peter and John were told by the Jewish Sanhedrin not to preach the gospel in Jesus' name. And their response was, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so when the government violates a principle of God's law, which, which would include murder of, of innocent life, or like the, the unborn, or even the government attempting to shut down the church, uh, Christians have a right to disobey under those circumstances. That was the case in early Christianity, in the early church. That was also the case throughout church history, where Christians would assemble underground regardless of what the government said. But, but apart from, from that, uh, we are called to submit to the authorities that be, that Christians ought to be civil servants and in the sense that they should obey, respect the government, insofar, again, as that government does not violate the, the scriptures or the, the, the law, the moral law of God, which trumps all of them. So, uh, so I think Christians should not become hermits. 
Uh, that's not to say that uh, the, the, in the church's history, uh, some of these monks, uh, were it not for these monks, we would not have the thousands of manuscripts that we have today, because many of these uh, New Testament Greek manuscripts and, and, and Coptic and Sahidic and Ethiopic, a lot of these manuscripts were the production of monks, and we are thankful for that. But at the same time, uh, the Church of Christ is not, we're never told to retreat. We're always told to go forward. The gates of Hades will not pre prevail against Christ's church. And so uh, we, we remain, we remain that, that's that salt of the earth. We, we remain that, that, that uh, movement in the earth that, that, if you will, curbs evil to some extent. Even Richard Dawkins openly admitted that with the disappearance of Christianity from the United Kingdom, he says, I fear what is going to fill in that void. And so he was honest enough to admit that Christianity was, in a sense, that that restraining force that kept the uh, the kingdom, the United Kingdom, from uh, from uh, coming down into into chaos. Excellent. All right, and, and Teddy, if you want to just give like sort of a five minute statement, what what do you think the role of the the Christian is in relation to a secular government? What yeah, what's our role there? Well, I think the most important role, and it, I think it. Uh, it's kind of similar to what Tony said, is uh, fighting for human rights where violations, where we see violations occurring. And in America, of course, the biggest one that happened, uh, you know, from the time of the founding was the enslavement of African Americans. And what we see now uh, in the post 1960s liberalism is not uh, an enslavement in a traditional sense, but this creation of, uh, for many African Americans, far too many, a permanent underclass. And the way that they are being used and abused by the Democratic Party still to this day. And I think that I, the best way to describe what I think is from the words of Dr. Shelby Steele, who I think is around 74 years old, and he uh, was born in Chicago during segregation and has experienced it. And he, uh, when he was a younger man, he uh, was a bit of a militant and had even uh, went to Africa uh, with his wife uh, for a Black Panthers uh, conference. And when they saw what was going on, then it didn't take very long before they decided we need to just get out of here. These people are thugs. But uh, he's a very, very proud, proud African-American, and rightly so. And um, I'd like to quote uh, something that I read of his, and uh, it, it really encapsulated so many of the things that uh, I also uh, thought. He said, post-19, and this is from the book he wrote uh, titled Shame, uh, it says, post-1960s liberalism wants minorities to accept their own inferiority so that they might be delivered from it by government interventions driven by the nation's remorse over the past. The tragedy here is that this liberalism asks minorities to believe that the inferiority imposed on them is their best leverage in society, thus making inferiority the wellspring of their entitlement and power, even as it undermines the incentive to overcome it. This is the dynamic that causes post-1960s liberalism to mimic precisely the same hierarchical patterns that the ideology of white supremacy imposed. Whites as superiors, minorities as inferiors who must be redeemed through the agency of others. And 
And if I've got time, there's there's one more quote. Do I have time for one more quote from Dr. Uh, yeah, Steele? Yeah, read the other one more quote. Okay. Um, he said, I had come to feel exhausted with and humiliated by liberalism, which seemed to be premised on the idea of permanent black inferiority, on the idea that blacks would always need special programs and preferences to reach anything like true equality. In my revulsion of this form of liberalism, it occurred to me that Ronald Reagan was something of a liberator. He aspired to what I came to think of as flat freedom, where everyone was treated the same and required to live by the same laws. No guilt over the past, no paternalism, no longing for redemption should interrupt the flatness of this freedom. Like the flat tax in which everyone pays the same tax rate, flat freedom makes no exceptions, offers no deductions for past injustices, and gives no preferences to engineer social justice. Reagan was inviting Blacks to function as free men and women in a free society. The implication of this was that he truly believed that Blacks and other minorities were, in fact, equal to white Americans, and that in a society committed to flat freedom, they could compete with all others. Liberalism was wobbly on this matter. Its policies always compensated for the possibility of real black inferiority. Reagan's conservatism, his idealism, was based on a conviction that blacks were fundamentally equal to all other races. Conservatism became my new idealism. Here was true and unencumbered freedom, the absence of both discrimination and patronizing interference. And so when I read these, these words of Dr. Steele, I, I, it was like, it, this is true. And, and this is why, for those of us who, uh, who believe that African Americans and other minorities are our equals, our brothers and our sisters, and that we are only differentiated by a difference in melanin in our skin, we don't have the need to pander to them because what sibling panders to their brother or sister? They don't, they talk to them like equals. And that is what emboldens me and others to, to tell it like it is to our brothers and sisters who are misguided into thinking that uh, continuing on with uh, democratic leaders and what their plans are for African Americans. Ever since the African Americans left the Republican Party that, that with their help liberated them, and when they went to uh, the Democratic Party, uh, by making a deal with FDR, thinking that his promises were going to pan out his, that with all the New Deal benefits when FDR was in the back room with the segregationists, mm -hmm. uh, cutting deals, saying we will, uh, what we'll do, yes, you know, we're, we'll make promises to the blacks that will give them New Deal benefits, but what we'll really do is make them make uh, no New Deal benefits uh, available for people that work in the two biggest areas that the African American people work in. The service industry in terms of like being, you know, uh, maids and things like that, as well as uh, agricultural labor. And so while a few African Americans benefited from the New Deal program, most of them didn't, and they were tricked 
by FDR, the same man that put second and third generation uh, Japanese in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And and it's just one thing after the other with the Democratic Party from the beginning Mm -hmm. with Andrew Jackson, their first Democrat and the Trail of Tears and what he did Mm -hmm. to the uh, to the Native Americans. It's just one thing after the other. And they need to come back to the party that is their home, where we value them and we don't pander to them. And we want, uh, we want freedom and economic success for them and, and for them to not be satisfied by crumbs to come get a bigger piece of the cake that is available here in the land of milk and honey. And so, um, anyway, that, that is just my, my message to, um, to all of my African American brothers and sisters. Excellent. Yeah. You, you actually combined, uh, both, both the final topics. So that, that was great that you combined that there. So, um, Tony, just before I turn it to you, so we are past the, the 415 mark, the two hour mark. Um, did you want, like, did you have a little extra time to go back and forth with Teddy or do you want me to sure. just final? Yeah. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. I, I, I could spare a couple of minutes. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so yeah, Tony, I'll, I'll just spare it, uh, turn it over to you to give sort of your take on these, these, political hot potato issues, you know, things like white privilege, uh, systemic racism, um, you know, that this sort of thing that we're all going through, equality of outcome. Yeah. What are Christians to make of these issues? Well, again, I think it goes back to to what, what I stated at the outset, and that is we need to understand the source of these ideas. The, all ideas, ideas have consequences. And we've seen that history of is a testament to that fact that ideas have consequences. And we need to get back to the origin of these ideas. And these ideas are, again, based on this Marxist uh, view of the, the oppressed versus the oppressor. It's, it is a view that seeks to divide and conquer. That's why there's so much divisiveness going on right now. It's a, it's a divisiveness between cultures and, and, and so-called races. Let me just make this caveat that, according to the Bible, there, there are no races plural. There's only one race, and that is the the human race, homo sapiens. We are thinking people. And that through Adam, the Bible says, from one man, God has made all humans on the earth. That is to say, there is no such thing, in my opinion, of black race and and yellow race and red race and white race and so forth. This is the type of language that that you will find um, in, in Darwin's literature, in his book, The Descent of Man. He talked about various races of humans and and he talked about the, 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 the Western European being superior to the savage races of Africa and so forth and so on. And, and so we need to get to the, to the root of, of these ideas. And so issues like uh, white privilege, um, a, a term that, uh, that originated with Peggy uh, McIntosh, a, a sociologist back in, in the 1980s. She was the first to use this terminology. Uh, this is an insidious idea that, that whites, by virtue of the fact that they have white skin, they are uh, ipso facto uh, privileged, it is, is a myth. Um, I came from, uh, my parents migrated to Canada from Portugal in the 1960s, and my dad, uh, of course, not being an English speaker, uh, my father had it very hard. My, my mother fell ill in her late 20s, she lost her kidneys and lost uh, her, her uh, lost her her job and and had to remain a stay-at-home mom uh, my father uh, ended up uh, taking up the, the mantle of, of of becoming the main bread earner and uh, i never got my white privilege membership card in the mail never and there are many and i'm sure you could attest to that too dale that uh, we don't uh, we never were privileged because we were simply white i, I think it's a myth it's it's a divisive um It's a divisive rhetoric that is used by Marxist groups like Black Lives Matter and also the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party will feed into this uh, divisive language because their one goal is to get rid of Donald Trump. That's their first goal and to 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 uh, to regain the the, the reins of power again. Um, And so just recently, when Nancy Pelosi was asked about, well, what do you think about these mobs taking these statues? And just throwing them into the harbor, and 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 she said, "Well, people will do what people will do," 
And they said, well, there's one thing to, you know, a legislature to call for the removal of a statue or a council coming together to agree, but a mob grabbing these statues and tearing them down and throwing them to a harbor. Well, her reaction was not, oh, this was a, this is an act of, uh, this is an illegal act. Her, her response, well, people will be people, you know, that's just the way they are. When I heard her say that, that, that for me told me what the Democratic Party was all about. It was not about law and order. It's about uh, the ends will just the, the 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 end will justify the means, which is a uh, again was commonly said by by the Marxists and and uh, uh, that whatever way we we do to get us to our desired end, it doesn't matter what we do. If we have to kill, if we have to uh, rape, if we have to uh, rob property, the the end will justify the means that we take to get there. So when when we look at this type of language, uh, this whole issue of Black Lives Matter. Well, from the biblical point of view, all lives matter, including black lives. We, we are all made in God's image. And then when we look at the rhetoric of uh, people being fired just for the, the I believe it was the president of, of the University of British Columbia, was fired just for liking a tweet that President Donald Trump put out, just liking a tweet. Uh, and then others being removed because they're questioning the narrative of, of, of the left. We are living in some very, very, very dark days. Uh, and and unless the tide has changed, we're going to end up like Minneapolis, where uh, the, the police have been defunded there. And, and we, we've seen the chaos that, that took over that city and then the attempts in Seattle, Washington, uh, and then, of course, in Portland, Oregon. This is the rhetoric of Marxism. It's meant to, uh, again, divide. It's meant to destabilize. Uh, a democratic, uh, democratically elected uh, officials, and to set up uh, a a regime where you end up with what we call socialism. Uh, now, the one thing I want to reiterate here is this: it, it, the, this whole fight is not about truth over power, because even truth now is being attacked and assailed by these groups as patriarchal. That uh, that truth is simply a it's chatter. It's simply a patriarchal form of oppression, uh, and so. The, the left, the social justice movement can be defined as follows. It's power over truth. It's not about truth. It's about gaining power at all costs. Whereas Christianity has always been truth over power. It is truth that will prevail in the end. It is truth that will set people free. Uh, and so we, we, are, we are living in some really, really trying times right now. And especially with this COVID epidemic and now this going on, um, I, I hate to see the results that, that are coming down the pipe. So, yeah, whatever is happening right now is not good. Not good for the West. It's going to be disastrous. All right. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think with that, we can wrap up um, the show. I think it was a, a great talk. I, I appreciated both Tony and Teddy coming on. Uh, ho hopefully you guys enjoyed your time uh, on sure. your end. Absolutely. Very much. I had a great time. Excellent. Thank you for having us dale anytime you yeah. guys you guys are great so perfect all right so um yeah to, uh, tony i'll um I'll, i'm not sure should i put in the sources uh are people still able to register for your class that you're teaching so i know it started the fifth yeah it, la it started last sunday but uh we have actually gotten some uh, stragglers this week coming on and saying hey is it still too late uh no they're 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 still they, they can still register um, tomorrow is our second class. So, um, yeah, if they're interested, um, I, I don't know how soon you'll get this podcast out, but, uh, if they're interested, they can just, uh, send an email to Toronto apologetics at gmail.com Toronto apologetics, all one word at gmail.com. And, uh, and they, they'll be given uh, directions on how to register. Perfect. Yep. And I'll put up the PDF. It'll, uh, it'll probably be up in like one or two days. So uh, okay. I'm pretty quick that way. So, uh, okay. yeah. And, uh, Teddy, um, so I know you were telling me you're debating starting up your own, uh, podcast on political issues. Have you, uh, decided on that or still thinking it over? Well, still thinking it over. I, I, I want to do it. I just need to, uh, <laughs> about finding the time to mm. uh to do it and maybe just uh you know here and there uh put on some uh some shows because uh you know it's it's yeah. nice being able to have these discussions with uh with folks and they give and take 
Perfect. Yeah. Well, if you you put it up, uh, I'll make sure to put up the links to, to that on the um, on the blog site for people as well. So, yeah. Um, I think the, just so the audience knows, the next new show that I have is on July 25th, and that's with uh, Dr. Michael Behe uh, and Marvin Wallace on intelligent design and the the evidence uh, for that versus evolution. So that's the next new show, and yeah, ha- have a great week, everybody. Thank you, and nice talking with you, Tony. Yes, you you too, uh, Teddy and Dale had a great time. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks.